And our ideology is what guides us to know what's the correct decision in, in each circumstance, which I think is really important for us. So this is my circumstance. I got here with all these kids and my beautiful wife and grandchildren. Why? Through the grace of God. That song is about God's grace surrounding your life. You know, so I, I would say I got all these beautiful children and my beautiful wife, not because I'm really handsome. I guess you're agreeing with that. <laughs> or, or, or not because I'm really super smart. It's because of God's <laughs> guidance. So reaching out to God's guidance is really the most important aspect of our lives, right? So, uh, and here's, uh, here's our newest granddaughter picture. And here's our other newest granddaughter picture. Then there's our newest grandson picture. He had to go to the dentist and he got this balloon. So he really loved his balloon. Even he went to, s he fell asleep holding his balloon. <laughs> you know, very interesting thing. Now when I see our grandson in his balloon and how much he loves his balloon, you know what's interesting? I love that little balloon. Even I don't have the balloon, I love that little balloon. Which, where do we get that feeling from? We think that feeling comes from God. If you love something God made, whether it's food or air or water or something or your children or your husband or your, then when, when, when God sees you love that thing, God feels some happiness and joy. Just like we feel some happiness and joy about our children. That's the whole point of Reverend Moon's teaching. It's the whole point. God is a parent who wants to love you, wants to protect you, wants to guide you. And uh, that's what it is. For example, Ramun teaches love cannot arise without a partner. Even the Almighty God needs a partner. Why did God create heaven and earth? What did the Almighty Absolute Being lack that he needed to create the heavens and the earth? What did he need? That he, so that he needed to create human beings. That is, he created them because God wants to love somebody. God wanted to give things to somebody. God wanted, to be, wanted somebody to be grateful to him for receiving those things. That's the whole point of the universe. It's the whole point of your life on earth. Love cannot arise without a partner. Even the almighty God cannot have love without a partner. And that's who we are, right? Love is the primary essence within God. It's God's core, right? Uh, Book of John says that God is love. That's the essence, fabric, fiber of God, right? Nonetheless, if God is alone... His, his love cannot manifest. Even the Almighty God, who's perfect and super intelligent and all these things, without someone to love and someone to love him back, is just alone, just feels lonely and is miserable and it's horrible, right? Human beings are the partners who enable God to manifest his love. It's not angels, it's not animals. God loves zebras and elephants and kill, he likes all those things, killer whales, but it's humans who are created to be his image on earth, to be the, the, the creatures that can respond to God's love with love and understanding, yes. right? So here's Reverend and Mrs. Moon. They believe their message is that they want to bless all couples throughout the world in marriage centered on God, right? And here's, this is the 2075 couple blessing in uh, April 1st. I always say, look, I was, I was standing right, no, I meant July 1st. Me and Siapa were standing right there. And, and, uh, and here's our question, why? Why are we doing this? Why do they spend so much time and effort doing that? Watch. Okay, as Christians, we believe that love is important. Right? Some people don't. They believe making money is important. Or they believe... Science is important. We like science. Or they believe whatever is important. Race cars are important, right? <laughs> Rock and roll is important. Anyhow, there's, there's many people who believe things are more important than love, but not us. Not us. If man, this is from the divine principle, if man sacrifices his physical body for the will of God, his spirit man lives under the dominion of God's love. Even though his physical body dies, by this he becomes a man of life and preserves his spirit man in eternal life in the love of God. Three, three words. Life, love, eternity are all involved in love for us. But life and love are, are, are dependent on each other. 
You can't have life without love, and you cannot have love without life. John 3.14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? How does he know? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love remains in death. So, again, for us, love is essential to our, to our life. If this is true, then we should need love for our life. Does that make sense? Yes. We should need love for our life. Here's, the, here's, uh, here's some proof. It should be a part of the fabric of our existence. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that special? Like that's John Kenny's song, Hallelujah, God is near, God is surrounding us, God is with us. But it's based on keeping the word and loving other people, right? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Make sense? Yes. To lay down your life for which friend? Who's your special friend, Big John? Who's your special friend? My spouse. That's right, exactly. Good answer. Here, I have a present for you. I, I lost a present. Anyhow. So, uh, so exactly right. We believe the blessing is sacrificial love for the sake of our spouse and for our children is the essence of God's will on earth. It's the essence. It's family values in a nutshell. John 17, 24. Father, God, Father, God, you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have not known that you sent me. Right? And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them as well. So for Christianity, the center of Christianity is God's love, Jesus' love, your love, love of brethren. Love is really important. Do you guys know what this is? Uh, yeah, that's right. This is a maternity ward from the 20s to the 50s. And yes, it's an old, ancient one. And look at this, and look at this. Babies are shown at this window from 11 to 12.45 p.m. You parents can see your children. Whoa. See that? Do you know why? Because there was a kind of, from the Enlightenment age, they thought human beings were made of meat. And human beings are meat. And if you just give people food and water and things like that, then they'll grow up and be okay. Give them enough proteins, enough sugars, things. In fact, in these days, in the 20s to 50s, they told women, don't breastfeed your children. Many of your mothers were told, don't breastfeed you because scientific formula that they put in the bottle is actually healthier than mother's natural milk. They used to say that. Mm. We know it's not true now. Now science has come to the conclusion that that's erroneous, right? Okay. Today, this is different. Today, newborn nurseries are no longer considered the best practice in American hospitals. They don't do this anymore. Mm. And their use is disappearing thanks in part to the widespread adoption of WHO, WHO is the World Health Organization's 1991 Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. So they, so they taught all the hospitals, don't do this anymore. This is wrong, right? The BFHI, a global program to promote hospital practices that encourage breastfeeding. So now women are encouraged to breastfeed their children. It uh, includes keeping healthy mother-baby pairs together as nurseries have begun closing. These are closing now. No more. We don't want them anymore. <laughs> Turn them into closets. Okay. Right. How did they come to this conclusion? Mm. I'll tell you the scientific discovery of Jesus' words. That's the whole point. Science's discovery that Jesus was right. <laughs> Watch. Okay, John Bowlby investigates the, uh, and his result. John Bowlby was a clinical psychologist who first studied delinquent children. And one of, his, one of the things he recognized in delinquent children is, uh, he wrote it in a book called uh, 49 Thieves. You can, you can Google it. And he said, I just studied with these 49 criminal teenage kids. Why, what happened to them? Is it something in them that causes them to be criminals? He discovered, no, it's not. It's a lack of parental love and support. So in 49 kids, he discovered, ah, 
Every single one of them has broken families, families in prison, fathers in jail, they're on drugs, they're alcoholics, they're beating them, they're abusive. And every single one of those delinquent kids he found, that's the background, right? So then he began to study more. He said, well, and then he began to study orphanage. When I started st researching orphanage and child health, I read the classical works of pediatrician Harry Bakken, psychologist, and John Bowlby's writing this, and psychiatrist Harry Edelson. At the beginning of the 20th century in the United States and United Kingdom, the death rates among infants placed in orphanages, nurseries, and family hospitals were, in some cases, close to 100%. Oh, no. so good. London's Foundling Museum documents in depth these harsh realities. In the 1940s, the work of psychoanalyst Renee Spitz further documented high infant rates, one out of three, and among the babies who didn't die, high percentages of cognitive, behavioral, and psychological dysfunction. What caused that? Most of these deaths were not due to starvation or disease. They had food in the orphanages, but to severe emotional and sensorial deprivation. In other words, the lack of love. These babies were fed and medically treated, but they were absolutely deprived of the important stimulation, especially touch and affection of their mothers and of their fathers. Do you, do you, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Let, let's, keep, let's keep going. So, Bowlby invented these words called failure to thrive. Okay, the def failure to thrive is definition. Occasionally, there may be underlying physical condition <coughs> that children don't get heavier, don't grow, right? These effects can occur in the esophagus, stomach, small, large intestine, rectum, or anus. However, Psychosocial problems, often stemming from lack of nurturing parent-child relations, can lead to a failure to thrive. That is, children die without parental love and support. The child may exhibit poor <laughs> appetite due to depression. So an infant can be depressed from what? Insufficient attention from their parents. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I think, I think Reverend Moon is right, that without parental love, Children don't make it. Let's keep going. Okay, so then he, he cr created this term. The term maternal deprivation is a scientific term. It's not something Christians made up or Jews made up or, or uh, we made up. It's a scientific term summarized in the early work of the psychiatrist and psychoanalyst John Bowlby on the effects of separating infants and young children from their mother or mother's substitute, like a father, right? Bowlby's work on delinquent and affectionate children and the effects of hospital and institutional care led to his being commissioned to write the World Health Organization's report on the mental health of homeless children in post-war Europe whilst he was head of the Department for Children and Parents at the Tavistock Clinic in London after World War II, right? Okay, so who did he write this to? World Health Organization. What did the World Health Organization do in 1991? They sent our teams to teach what John Bowlby was teaching them. Do you see that connection? Uh, the result was the monograph Maternal Care and Mental Health, published in 1951, which sets out the maternal deprivation hypotheses. <coughs> His main conclusion is that the infant and young child should experience a warm, intimate, continuous relationship with his mother or permanent mother substitute. For example, father, and of course we accept uh, parenting by adopted parents and things like that. That's a successful method. And by the way, do you know why there's no orphanages in, in California? Because of this. That's why when you hear parents whose parents are in jail or die, they go to a foster home. They thought foster homes, orphanages kill people, so we're going to create foster homes and not have any more orphanages. It all comes from Bowlby, by the way. So you can look it up if you want. Or a father in which both find, sat in which both find satisfaction and enjoyment. <coughs> enjoyment of love of mother and father and children is now a scientific term. Did you know that? And it helps a child to grow, be smarter, better, stronger, and that not to do so might have significant and irreversible mental health consequences without children receiving the full love of their mother and father. Isn't that amazing? And now science. Okay, let's go. Now this is, this is pretty tragic, but it's a real study that actually really happened. Okay, you can go, I put this here so you can Google it if you want to. 1944. <coughs> People, okay, well, you, if you read about Bowlby's thing, he said it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. It wasn't fact yet. 
44, they did this experiment to see if Bowlby's hypothesis is, in fact, fact. In the United States, 1944, an experiment was conducted on 40 newborn infants to determine whether the individuals could thrive alone on basic physiological needs without affection. They, okay, let's test this hypothesis. This crazy uh, psychoanalyst says we've got to love our kids. Well, we don't want to do that. 20 newborn infants were housed in a special facility where they had caregivers who would go in to feed them, bathe them, and change their diapers. But they would do nothing else. No goo-goo, no hugging, no kissing. The caregivers had been instructed not to look at or touch the babies more than what was necessary, never communicating with them. All the physical needs were attended to scrupulously and the environment was kept sterile. None of the babies becoming ill. So no, they didn't get sick. But here's the result, right? <coughs> the experiment was halted after four months, by which time at least half the babies had died at that point. They didn't die from a disease or coronavirus or from lack of nutrition. They died from lack of love. So now, so now we know it's no longer a hypothesis. Love is a real thing. Love is a real thing that children need to receive that love from mother and father. Right? At least two more died even after being rescued and brought into a more natural familial environment. There was no psychological cause for the baby's death, physiological cause for the baby's death. They were all physically very healthy. Before each baby died, there was a period where they would stop verbalizing and trying to engage. So they got depressed. They stopped trying to talk. They stopped trying to see the caregiver. They just gave up life. And, uh, uh, generally stop moving or nor even cry or even change expression. Death would follow shortly. Now this is science telling you this is what happens, right? The babies who had given up before being rescued died in the same manner even though they had been removed from the experimental conditions, mm -hmm. right? So because this was like irreversible. Once there was a certain amount of time when they were deprived of touch, kissing, loving, goo goo ga -go, hugging, then even though they came out of that, they still died. It was irreparable damage to the child. The conclusion was that nurturing is actually a very vital need in human beings. Whilst this was taking place in a separate facility, the second group of 20 newborn infants were raised with all their basic physiological needs provided and the addition of affection from the caregivers. This time, however, the outcome was expected. No deaths. So long as the babies were hugged, kissed, smooched, goo goo ga ga, make funny noises to, sing to, they're perfectly healthy. So this is now scientific fact, so that's why they start beginning to change in nurseries. Those old nurseries ideas are crazy. The old materiali materialism idea is crazy. So here's what happened. So, this, so they began closing, why? Because of this. As influential thinkers and organizations continue to reimagine the postpartum period as a time of Breastfeeding, clinically managed bonding, and a jump start in developing the right mothering habits. So then the world changed, right? right. So what do, we, what do we know from these scientific experiments? What do we know? One, babies die without constant love and attention. Love is now a scientific term. It's a, it's a real term, right? We call care and attention love. Love takes time and attendance, right? If you, all the mothers in the room realize when you have a newborn baby, it takes a lot of time, takes sacrifice, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Whoever would sacrifice himself for another, that's the greatest love in the whole world. Don't we consider mother's love and father's love the greatest love in the whole world? See how they're all the same? It's all the same meaning. Love takes sacrificial time and attendance. That's what real love is. Right? That is why saints get up early in the morning to pray and worship God to find the Holy Spirit. You have to have sacrificial time to pray. It has to be sacrificial. Let's keep going. Babies die without love. Okay? So do we. So do we, by the way. So do your children. So do your husbands and wives. So will your marriage die without love, without God's love. Without God's love being, without being centered on God, you might give up. You might get tired. I don't want to sacrifice for that guy anymore. He's bald, he's short, he's fat. <clears throat> Just, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> so here's the rule. Here's the rule about life. We know we are alive because what? We love the brethren. So life and love have to go together. Right? Scientifically, we know life and love must go together. You can't have love without life and you cannot have life without love. He who does not love remains in death because we are in the image of God. That's why. Even God could not be alone. Even the Almighty God could not be alone. That's why we call our church Family Church, because we don't want to be alone. We know aloneness is death. Aloneness is death. Holding your love back from others is death for them and for you. Right? Because being alone is not of God. God did not create you to be alone. It's not good. Thank you, John. Kenny. It's not good that man should be alone. You're going to die, men. Be nice to that old lady. Should God be alone? Is even God can be alone? No. Even God's super powerful, can make stars and do all these things. Even God cannot be alone. That's why you're alive. God didn't want to be alone. He wanted to be with you. He wanted you to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and with all your strength. Right? That's the first and greatest of all commandments. To love God. And if you love God, if anyone loves me and loves my Father, we'll, my Father will love him and we will come and make our home with you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? I want God to live with me. I want God to live in our home. I want God to see baby grandchild with a balloon and being happy. We want... Whole, that's why Mrs. Moon wants to save North Korea. God wants to see North Korean children well fed, good in school, free, creative, imaginative. God wants to see all those 19 million North Koreans who are left alive to be free, full of food, and creative and loving God. It's hard to love God when you're starving <laughs> to death, right? It's hard to love God. So here's what Reverend Moon said Why did God create heaven and earth? What did the Almighty Absolute Being lack such that he needed to create human beings? He created them out of love. And that's why we also cannot live without love. We can't live without love. If God can't live without love, can we live without love? No. no. Love, love cannot arise without a partner. Love is a primary essence within God. Nonetheless, if God is alone, his love cannot manifest. Even God cannot be alone. Babies can't be alone. Husbands can't be alone, and neither can wives be alone. Human beings are the partners who enable God to manifest his love. Amen? Amen. Probably I should just stop there. But I'm not going to. Don't do it. Whoa. <laughs> okay, parasystem. So how did God want love to manifest on the earth? Did he want us to be celibate monks? No. no. God, but from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, of the creation, God made the male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Right? No aloneness. No aloneness. And what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Right? So, and Malachi, why? Why this? Malachi 2.5 gives the answer. And why one? Because God wanted godly offspring. God wanted to see children. God, if you love your children, don't you think God loves your children? Yeah. Jesus said, when you count the fingers and toes on your newborn baby, God's counting every hair on their head. That's how precious they are to God. He's counting every hair. 2,519, 2,520, right? He's counting every hair. Six, five, four. <laughs> yeah, that, and then reverse. Yeah, yeah, that, that reverse is, uh-oh. 2059, uh-oh, 2058, uh-oh, oh, 2030, we lost 20 on that last brush. Anyhow, so, you're right. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <sighs> so we say God is one. Initially, God is one, right? That's the that's foundation of Hebrewism and Christianity. God is one. However, God made them male and female, and God made them in the image of God, right? He made Father, you, every human being, man and woman, has 46 chromosomes, right? There's only one cell in your body with only 23 chromosomes. You know what cell that is? Either a sperm cell in a man and an egg cell in a woman. That's all. There's only one, one cell. 
I mean, uh, you have many eggs and many sperms, God bless God. Anyhow, <laughs> the two shall become one flesh. God created this because he created it for love. I know the whole fallen world thinks sexuality is dirty. And we don't like to talk about it. But actually, we should talk about it because that's where love is. God created us to love one another and be in love with one another and create children. So when two, when husbands and wives love each other, get together naked and have children, what happens? God's will is accomplished. God has children and grandchildren that he can see and be with and love them, right? So the two, 23 chromosomes from man, 23 from woman, come together and become one child with 46 chromosomes. Isn't that amazing? Perfect math. Perfect mathematics. Perfect. And it's the mathematics of love. Right? It's not just mathematics. It's not just counting numbers. It's the mathematics of true love. It's the mathematics of children. Who does God love the most? Children. What did Jesus say? Children are what the kingdom of heaven is made out of. So when you see these, you could think numbers, chromosomes, genetic, or you would really think this is the essence of God's love on earth. This is the method God will create love on earth. And so here what you get. You go from here to here. And ideally, man, woman, love each other, and babies inside, and babies inside there, inside the mother, like that. That's what a baby looks like. There's the umbilical cord. So we say this process is automatic. There is no human being created this process. No human being participated in the creation of this process. We say this is God. This is the work of God, right? Because no human beings create, can create the bag of waters, umbilical cord. No man or woman designed this. Only God could possibly design this. It can't happen by accident, right? This is God's work, right? And inside the, inside the baby, whatever the mother eats, the baby eats, right? One flesh. Didn't God say you should become one flesh? Whatever mother eats, the baby eats. Whatever the mother breathes, the baby breathes. Whatever the mother drinks, the mother drinks. Whatever the mother feels, the baby feels. Whatever the mother feels, the baby feels. Listen to this. Now, this is really important. Oh, I missed it. I think I missed it. Maybe not. Our first sensations of life begin in our mother's body. Warmth. What do, what do babies feel inside? Warmth. You know, they take pictures now. Video cameras. Wow. Warmth, comfort, sensations of movement as our brain, mind, body, our character and spirit are, is, is developing. We are in the warm and comfort of our mother's body. Mother's love. So we ask a question. Isn't it two supposed to become? Where's dad? Where's dad, husband, father in this equation? Oh, so, but, so this is what happens, right? This is God's will. When, when God sees this, this fulfills the purpose of creation. This is what God wanted all the time. That mothers, so this is modern. They got rid of the old nurseries, and now this is what they do. Now they understood from John Bowlby and modern science, babies should be lying naked on the mother's skin. Does that scare you? you when he said the word naked, isn't that bad? <laughs> No! <laughs> when it's mother and child, baby should lie naked, skin touch relationship with the mother, that they get the most health, most emotional benefit, most intellectual growth, simply from touching a mother's skin. It's called the golden hour. Call it the golden hour, right? Immediately after a child's birth, the first place to go, mother's skin, right? God's nature is the divine parental nature, the expression of the creator of the universe is mind, body, and also masculine and feminine. Therefore, God is mind and body, and God is harmonized masculine and feminine, so, what God, so that God is the original true parent of all mankind. Like we said before, we get our eyes from where? From God. We get our heart from God. We get the essence to love. We get the, the need to not be alone. Where does it come from? God. It comes from God. God has the same feeling you have. And, but really, you have the same feeling as God. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When, we, then when he had placed his hands in them, he went from the office. That's what skin touch is all about, right? Jesus gave us the example. Skin touch. I'm going to touch those babies, kiss them on the cheek, hold them, pray for them, bless them, and that's my relationship with the children. So what happens is this. Baby, mother's naked, baby's naked. It's okay. It's not a sin. Okay? Don't worry. Don't get all crazy on me. Mother and baby should be skin touch. You know where this is from? Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were supposed to be naked and unashamed. Naked and unashamed. So babies, mothers should be together naked and unashamed. That ends can touch relationship. See, this is what they came to understand. 
through Bowlby. So now, this is the idea. Father and mother. Father and mother. Okay, I missed the slide. Ephesians. How should we live? Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Same meaning, right? No, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Isn't that amazing? That's what we're teaching. So dad, what does dad do? Mother's carrying the baby, dad is feeding the mother, ideally. Dad maintains a loving household, a safe environment, and a rich spiritual atmosphere for mother and child. Father, in effect, prepares a womb for the mother and child. That's our, that's our environment that we live in. Uh, in modern childbirth classes, fathers are taught to massage mother, care for mother. Mother should hear nice music, experience the feeling of being loved by her husband, and we believe in an extended family. So that's why we're family church, not just husband and wife. Now listen to this. When mother feels loved by her husband, mother gets massaged, husband brings home wonderful foods for her, brings home presents, tells her how much he loves her, how beautiful she is, holds her hand. When mother feels loved by her husband, her body's filled with a chemical called oxytocin. It's a chemical of love. And then she feels all warm and huggy and love inside. You know who else feels it? Baby, which fills the baby with feelings of love. So from before birth, from before birth, baby's supposed to be filled with feelings of love. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That is why Reverend and Mrs. Moon are out blessing people and teaching true family values. This is the next wave of human evolution. So, right, this idea of skin touch relationship, who does it come from? Jesus. It comes from our Heavenly Father directly through Christ, through Reverend Mrs. Moon, to the modern world. And he inspired scientists to figure this out. Only took them 2,000 years to figure out Jesus was right. So we say this is the religious view of marriage and family, right? This is our religious view that God created, designed us to live in a family as one flesh. Aren't we one flesh with our children? In fact, more so, right? When our children get hurt, parents cry. Isn't that true? Yeah. Kids don't even care, right? Kid gets a scratch or cut, kids don't care. Parents care, right? When children are happy, parents are happy. Let's keep going. The love that Jesus and true parents describe is real. This is the love that science describes. Science now says what true parents have been teaching us for 50 years. What Jesus has been teaching us for 2,000 years. That babies are designed to grow in the love of mother and father. And this is the best way, most close to ideal way to raise a family. That's why we call it ideal families for true love. This is why we're concentrating on preparing for and maintaining marriage as a support system and source of love for the child and God. For the, not only the child, but for God too. Now for us who are still alive in the 21st century, we have the greatest chance in human history. We, now we know these things, right? Yes. Our parents didn't know them. And their parents didn't know them. But now we know that this is very real and so we know how to raise our children, and more importantly, we know how to raise our grandchildren. We know how to teach our children to raise their children. So we can have the next several generations be utterly different than our generation, the World War II generation, or I'm post-World War II generation. Right? We could change the world if we could teach people the truth. So here's Reverend Mrs. Moon, right? And they always exemplify the truth, right? They're, they're always hugging, loving, kissing, touching, holding. That's what we're supposed to be like. So we could see an example of how should husbands and wives behave. Like this. Ramon reiterates, why did God create heaven and earth? I want a man like me and a woman like me with substantial form so I can watch them running about. God wants men and women running about. It is fun to watch them and that is why I created them. God loves things. It's just fun to be, watch you. Do you like what I'm saying, that I'm saying this? Or watching the two run about is good, but more than that, I want to see them embrace each other and frolic together. He wants husbands and wives to do what? Embrace. Frolic. Frolic. What a great word, huh? Frolic. <laughs> Which one do you prefer? Right? After all said and done, God wanted to see men and women loving each other. 
That's why we teach the blessing of marriage. That's why we do this, right? Do you think that God would rather see men and women competing against each other or loving each other? He doesn't mean like not playing ping pong together or not playing cards together. He wants to see them love each other, right? From the beginning, love was the original motivation behind the creation of the universe. Therefore, it's perfectly logical to conclude that God will show himself to this created world as the original being of love. And we're getting closer to that. So that's why we do this. That's why Reverend Mrs. Go around, we go around the whole world teaching thousands and thousands of people to get married. Everywhere we've gone. This was a small marriage ceremony of only 4,150 people. It was a small marriage ceremony. We did 30,000 couples. 60,000 people got married at once. Why? And we go to you, right? We say, please join us in the marriage blessing ceremony. Love your spouse. Love your children. So the big question is, how do we get there from here? Yeah. Right? This is really important. True love between husband and wife and children. It's hard, right? The reality is, I always teach these loving stories, but marriage is hard. And there's lots of people who don't believe. I began saying, we Christians believe love is of paramount importance. There's lots of people who don't believe that. There's lots of believe, people who believe sexual seduction is of paramount importance. There's lots who believe that, think that par pornography is of paramount importance. Lots of people believe that pedophilia is of paramount importance. A lot of people think that divorce, the ability to divorce or abort a child, is of paramount importance to the public domain, right? A lot of people simply have different ideas. We, we, we have to understand, if we understand why we should consider marriage important, why do we consider marriage important? That is the well-being care of the next generation of children, then people can understand how to overcome various temptations and difficulties, right? And we have to be centered on God. Like John Kenny Song said, God wants to be with us. So if God is with us, you'll get great ideas, right? When you struggle with your husband. What's the first law of thermodynamics? That is, you cannot get more out of the system than you put into it. If you're not getting some input into your family, into your mind about how to love your wife, if you're not getting some input from God how to love your children or love your, love your husband, you may run out of ideas. You may get tired. You may become exhausted. You may become negative. No. People are designed by God and need God's blessing. This whole idea comes from God, so we need to know it. Through sacrificial prayer on the mind of God, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, with inspiration and new strength to enable you to love your spouse and love your children. We well, you know divorce exists. We you know life isn't just uh, unicorns and rainbows. You know, once you get married, it isn't just all, you know, love and daisies and flowers and roses. It's not like that. It's hard work. It takes sacrificial love to make a marriage work. We admit that and accept it. So long as you know that in the beginning, when it comes to sacrifice, you think, aha, I want to sacrificially love this old man or old woman because God will dwell with us. It will make God happy. See? It will make God happy. If you have the goal in your mind and heart, you can make the necessary effort to accomplish the goal. John 14, 23, If anyone loves me and my Father will love him, we will come and make our home with him. Amen? Amen. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed... Uh,